Welcome to Way of Grace. Uh, I don't know if our technology is on yet, if we're streaming. Okay, awesome. Okay, so those of you that are watching us from home, wherever you are in TV land, uh, we are glad to have you joining us virtually. Uh, you can sing with us. We're going to sing a song that many of you know more about Jesus. More about Jesus. Let's, let's sing this one. Um, those of you that, that know, uh, you can help lead. For those that don't know it, we'll sing this and then we'll open up with the word of prayer. Okay? All right, we're going to sing more about Jesus. One, two, three. More about Jesus would I know. Spirit of God, we pray that you would sanctify us in this truth. We pray that you would illuminate our minds and our hearts and increase our understanding. Stretch us, Lord, in our cog all of our cognitive faculties by which our mind is challenged and stretched, that it will grow, but also that our heart would be impacted, that it would increase in faith and love towards you and commitment towards you, devotion to you and your word. 
and love towards your people. We ask for forgiveness of sins, Lord. <clears throat> we ask for the comforting grace of the, of the third person, Lord. Those of us that are going through a personal trials, you know what they are. Help us, O oh God. Give us grace to uh, go through those trials. And as we go through those trials, even though we might be struggling, help us to keep our eyes on Christ, to trust him and look to him. He's the faithful shepherd who promises never to leave nor to forsake his sheep. Bless us now. Uh, we pray that you'll save those that are lost. Um, we pray for every soul that is here and those that are watching from afar. You promised that if Christ be lifted up, he would draw all men unto himself, people from all over the world. And we pray that you will do it here in person, that you'll do it through the live stream, that the gospel will uh, go through all of the available airways to the four winds of the world, and it will penetrate the hearts of your elect, convert and save them, and irresistibly bring them to your son. And help us just as we sing this song to learn more and more about Jesus, to see him coming in the volume of the book. Bless us now. Uh, overcome our, our fatigue, tiredness, um, um, distractions and mind drifting in different places. Lord, help us. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is oh so weak. Help us to focus on your word. Help us to hear your voice at this time. We pray these blessings on us and your church all over the globe where the children of God are gathered together for Bible study at this time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, you guys can be seated. If you will, please turn to Mark 13. We are in the 13th chapter of Mark. If you like to turn there, Mark 13. All right, is everybody there? We are going to read our text. <clears throat> if you're in a 13 chapter Mark, I'm going to start at verse 28. <clears throat> I'll be reading from the King James. You can follow in whatever version of the Bible you have, whatever copy of God's Word you have. Mark 13, let's start at verse 28, <clears throat> and let's go down through verse 33. Okay, Mark 13, verse 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and put in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all things, till all these things be done. <clears throat> Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for you know not when the time is. Thus is the reading of God's precious word. Let's remember to turn our phones off, too. Let me go ahead and just say that now. Let's everybody just check your phones. You can put it on a silent or vibrate or, or whatever you want to <coughs> do. So we want to try to get out ahead of any unnecessary distractions. Uh, let's pray one more time. Thank you again, Father, for this time. We thank you for the precious souls that are here. Uh, we thank you for the election of God, for you choosing your people before the foundation of the universe. And had you not first come to us, called us, chosen us, and written our names in the Lamb's Book of Life and irresistibly drew us and lovingly invaded our souls, we never would have come. Thank you for giving us the grace to be here at this time. And we pray that our coming to Christ would not be a one-time thing, but it would be a lifelong thing. Help us, O oh God, draw us even now. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> All right, so I hope you guys are there. Go ahead and look at your title. It should be uh, dated at the top 4, 5, 24. As you can see in where we are in Mark 13, we are almost done with the Olivet Discourse. We are almost there. It's 37 verses. So my anticipation is this week, if we get through these points, and then next week, um, Lord willing, and, and we're looking at uh, chapter <clears throat> 14. So the title is The Valuable Lessons from the Fig Tree. If, if you've been with us for a while, and Mark, what you probably notice is you can't really get away from the fig tree. <laughs> we haven't really been able to get away from the fig tree, and the Lord has used the illustration of the fig tree numerous times 
through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're going to see several of them today. Some of them you are probably aware of. Some of them you might not have ever considered before. Uh, the fig tree runs through the Old and the New Testament. And here, <clears throat> the fig tree is the object lesson that the Lord Jesus Christ uses to teach a valuable lesson as he closes out his ministry. Remember, we are at the very end of our Savior's um, ministry here on earth. He is closing out Wednesday. He's entering into Thursday, right? We just celebrated Calvary night on what night? Friday, right? So there's only one more day. So Wednesday and Thursday, two days later, as Mark 14 starts off, the Lord Jesus was taken late Thursday night and was crucified uh, Friday morning into early evening from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. We talked about that before. <clears throat> so he's leaving some very important last words with his disciples. And notice when he says in verse 28, let's just go ahead and dive in. He says, now learn a parable of the fig tree, the fig tree, the fig tree. So what I, first thing I want to point your attention to is, and if you will, <clears throat> I encourage us to take notes. It would be good for you to take notes. I want you to write down the fig tree. And one of the things that I want us to be able to see here is the fig tree is a not only a choice description or a choice object lesson that the Lord uses to describe national Israel, but the fig tree all through the Old Testament was also a type of object lesson or a symbol that God used to describe the nation of Israel. Now you guys know we're in chapter 13. It was it was only two chapters ago that Jesus cursed the fig tree. You guys remember that? Just flip back there real quick. <coughs> You can flip that, flip back to Mark chapter 11, and it was not that long ago. In fact, uh, we could even say it was yesterday. It really was yesterday. Because it was just a day or so ago that Jesus had been going into the temple and had been coming out of the temple, and then he saw a fig tree. And notice what it says that he did here. Go back to Mark 11:11. 11, 11. Mark 11:11. 11, 11. Is everybody there? <clears throat> Watch this. It says, so, so you'll see the fig tree is nothing new. It says, and Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. So he goes into Jerusalem, walks through the temple, looks around, says, come on, fellas, let's leave. He turns around and they leave and they go right, right down the street to Bethany. Remember, Bethany was not even a mile away, right? It was on, an, on, the, on the mountain that was adjacent to it. Now, verse 12, and on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing a what? See, we're only two chapters removed. He had already mentioned a fig tree a couple chapters back. And it says, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves. Now, in our text in Mark 13, our fig tree is, is said to sprout what? Leaves also. But notice what's missing in chapter 11 is also missing in our text in chapter 13. If you read with me. Notice he says, a fig, he's seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves. He came, if happily he might find anything thereon. What does he mean, anything thereon? Fruit. Fruit. Jesus is God who has come out of heaven to inspect his church. So you can write down the fig tree here is his church slash Israel. The fig tree here is his church slash Israel. And he's coming to inspect Israel his church, to see if there is any fruit on it. Now, Jesus was a real man, and we know that as a real man, it's not just an object lesson. He was actually hungry because he had real humanity, right? And he comes to the tree. <clears throat> he doesn't see any fruit on it. And notice what it says. He came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Not the full harvest. The full harvest wasn't there yet, but this time of the year, there still should have been figs on the tree. The small, I talked about the distinct types of figs. Uh, we won't go back over that, but there was a small type, a green type of fig that should have been on the tree at this time, and there should have been plenty of them, and there was none. So it says, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Now look at verse 14. And Jesus <clears throat> answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples, what? And they heard it, right? Now jump to verse 20. 
And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the what? Fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remember it said unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which you what? Cursed. What are we seeing here? Jesus cursed the fig tree. And the tree withered. Look, he said, the fig tree which you cursed is what? Withered. And when you compare this with Matthew and Luke, it says that as soon as Jesus spoke to the tree. Now, Jesus is the only person that can talk to a tree. The tree, listen, please don't do this. Okay. <laughs> right. When you hear people say Jesus is our example. Jesus is our example. Yes, he's our example, but he's also our substitute and our sin bearer and our savior, which means that there are not only was he our example and a model for us to follow, but Jesus also stands in another category whereby he did things that you and I are not designed to do. Like you're not designed to walk on water. You're not designed to read people's minds and hearts. You're not designed to curse fig trees and speak to the weather, right? And speak things into existence, hint, hint. And speak things into existence, hint, hint. Only God can do that, right? Genesis chapter 1. But Jesus is cursing the fig tree because the fig tree has no fruit. Is Jesus just losing his temper because of hunger pains? You know how we can get when our blood sugar spikes or it drops too low, right? And, and if you haven't eaten in uh, a couple of meals, you can be real angry and snappy at people, huh? Is that what's happening here? No, not at all. Not at all. <clears throat> so Jesus is cursing the fig tree because what this symbolizes is that Israel was cursed. The fig tree is Israel. And they were cursed because they rejected Messiah. They were cursed, listen, because they did not have faith in Jesus. All men and women who reject the gospel and refuse to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are under a curse. Is that a true statement? Remember the Ten Commandments, the moral law came with a curse. And the law says, cursed is everyone who continues not in the things that are written in the law. Isn't that what the Bible says? Right. Galatians 3.10, for example, would say that, right? <clears throat> so Israel, remember, the Bible says, sought righteousness by the law instead of through what? Faith. Therefore, they were under the what? curse. So Jesus is pronouncing the spiritual condition of Israel because when he came up and looked at the tree and looked under the leaves, he saw no fruit. Many people will be in that condition on the last day who were religious, who went to church, who knew the Bible, but had, had leaves, but had no fruit. The thing that God is looking for is fruit. And Israel missed it. They had a form of godliness, but denied the what? The power thereof, right? They were not converted. They were not converted. So what you're seeing here is Israel as an object lesson of the fig tree. So now when you go to chapter 13, we see our Savior picking it back up again. And when he's talking about the fig tree again, who is he talking about? Israel. Israel, who rejected Messiah. There's no way you can be accepted with God when you kill his son. Isn't that right? The only Savior for men comes into the world. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. If you reject Jesus, he's the only savior. You cannot be saved apart from faith in Jesus, right? All right, we would bring a curse upon ourselves by rejecting him. So <clears throat> verse 28, back in our text, Mark 13. So when he says, learn a parable of this fig tree, and then what he goes on to do is describe the stages. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So point one, the fig tree is a type and signification of national Israel. Go to letter A on your outline. Letter A, as a type of national Israel. So go with me to Jeremiah, please. I want you to see this in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and we've learned this before, that the New Testament, if you ever are curious about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, is one of the ways, there's many ways we can describe it as you go to Jeremiah 24. But here's a way that you can describe it. The New Testament is a commentary on the Old Testament. You guys get that? The New Testament is a commentary on the old. Here's another way you can say it. The New Testament is the expansion of the old. The New Testament is the explanation of the old. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the old. The old foreshadows the new. The new fulfills the old. Did everybody get that? Okay. Y'all with me? Y'all? Okay. 
Okay, Jeremiah chapter 24. Watch the vision that God gives his prophet in the Old Testament. We're going to look at a couple of the, uh, the Old Testament prophets and minor prophets tonight. I hope that's okay. And watch this, verse 1. <clears throat> Verse 1, it says, the Lord showed me, watch what the Lord shows the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of what? There they go again. Two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. So right there, you should see a connection between the figs and the what? Temple. The figs and the what? Temple. The temple was the uh, premier symbol of religion in Israel. The temple is where the worship took place. The temple is where the priests were and the leaders were. The temple is where the sacrifices were. The temple is where you had to go to meet God. Does everybody know that? Are you guys with me? The temple is where you had to go to meet God under the old covenant. Remember, he dwelt in the most holy place on the mercy seat between the two cherubims. And that was his throne. Right. So the temple was a big deal. Israel took it too far because they ended up worshiping the temple instead of worshiping God. That being said, though, it says the Lord showed me, uh, behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. So this would be between uh, um, 606 and 587 B.C. Okay. now watch the two baskets. One basket had very good figs. What are the good figs representing there? The elect. If you're a believer in Christ, you're represented by the good figs. You want to write that down. Did you know you're a good fig to God? You're a good fig in God's sight. Remember, true believers are good because the only good one is Jesus and he's in us. And Jesus, by his death and the shedding of his blood, has washed away our sins. And now God looks at us as good because we're covered under the blood of Christ. Did everybody see that? All right. So one basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs. See that? (laughs) Which could not be eaten. They were what? So bad. Those are the non-elect. The first basket represents the sheep. The second basket represents the goats. The first basket represents the elect. The second basket represents the non-elect. Okay? Go to verse evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten. They are what? Is he driving home the point? What doesn't that describe our inherent nature before salvation? That the Bible says that our heart is de- deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Right? There's nothing good in us until we're born again. All right. So they're so evil. Verse four. And again, the word of the Lord came unto me. Who is that? Jesus. Are you guys with me? The word of the Lord is a person. The word of the Lord is a person. God is speaking to Jeremiah through Christ. And the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Does everybody see that there? So those are the elect. Listen, those are the elect that are going to go into bondage for how many years? 70 years, and at the end of 70 years, God is going to deliver them, isn't he? Do you remember who it was that brought them out? No, no, who brought them out? They went 70 years, and yes, the, well, the Medo-Persians came in, took over the kingdom. They issued the decree under Darius for them to go back home, right? But do you remember the men that let them out? Yes, back in the back. Cyrus. Well, well Cyrus was the king that, um, that uh, made the decree that they could go home. But who are the two primary leaders that actually led them back? It's in Ezra chapter 1, and it's in Haggai chapter 1. And their names are in Zechariah, also chapter 6. Don't turn there. You can write it down look at it later. All right, Joshua, the, the uh, son, the high priest, the son of Josedek. And then Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. Y'all don't remember those names? Okay, okay, all right. Right. Remember, Joshua is the high priest and Zerubbabel was the what? The governor, the ruler out of Judah. Who's the king that comes out of Judah? Jesus. So one was a high priest and one was a king. Both of those men together represent one man. Jesus, who was our king priest, our Melchizedekian king priest. Right. 
So these two men led them out, who's a picture of Jesus that leads us out of captivity to the devil and out of bondage to sin and out from under the curse of the law. We just celebrated his resurrection last Sunday. We're loosed from the grave, justified by his resurrection and, and, and justified in the sight of God, right? Okay, but they led him out. Those men that came out represent the elect. Do you guys know that not everyone came out? Does everybody know that? There was maybe between 40, over, um, there were several waves of people that came out under Nehemiah, also under Ezra, and then under Zerubbabel. There were at least three different waves of those that, from Judah that went back home. But altogether, it was about 40 or 50,000 people. But there were hundreds of thousands of Jews down there. Many of them didn't come back out. Like the gospel came to you one day and turned you, but it didn't turn your friend. It turned you, but it didn't necessarily turn your neighbor. It turned you, but it didn't necessarily turn all of your relatives. We're still praying for them, right? We're still, we're still uh, preaching the gospel to our relatives. But the, the, the difficult uh, uh, concept to grasp is that many are calling, but few are chosen, right? But, but, but God called you. The gospel came to Saul on the road to Damascus. But do you guys remember there were other men that were with him? And that heard the sound, but were not able to discern the voice of Jesus. Saul heard Jesus' voice, but the other men that were with him didn't hear it. You guys remember that? So that's God's distinguishing grace to choose whom he will and bring them out. That's why you're here and other people are not. Because God chose to bestow grace on you. So he brings the elect out, the good figs. Okay, And notice when he says here, verse 6, For I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them. And not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. That's what God does when he puts us in Christ. When God places a believer in Christ, he will never pluck them out again. He will never allow them to perish. He will never allow them to fall away. Once God engrafts you into the vine, you're good to go. You're there for all eternity. All right? Verse 7. And I will give them a heart to know me. I am the Lord and they shall be my people. And I will be their God. I love that God's not ashamed to call us his people. I love that. For they shall return unto me with their what? Whole heart. That's what you do when you're saved. But look at verse 8. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely, <clears throat> thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and then that dwell in the land of Egypt, and I will deliver them to be, watch this, I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. One, he operates according to their good. The other, he operates according to their hurt. Does everybody see that there? God is right to do both, isn't he? Yes, he is. <clears throat> he says, to their hurt and to be a reproach and a proverb and a taunt and a curse. That would be a shame and an ignominy by which people all around will infamously remember them for, for shame. For shame, okay? In all places where I drive them, one more verse, and I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Man, that's, that's powerful language, isn't it? But do you see the difference between the good figs and the evil figs? Again, he's describing his people uh, as, as figs or being like fig trees. So I wanted you to see that one. Now, go with me to Luke 13. Here's another one. And then we're going to go back to the minor prophets again. We're going to go to Luke, and then we are going to go back to the minor prophets. Luke 13 is another one, and then I think you'll be full of figs by then. <laughs> figs sound so good right now, don't they? <clears throat> All right, go to Luke chapter 13. Everybody there? Okay, Luke 13, watch our Savior use uh, another parable around figs. Luke chapter 13, let's start at verse 6. <clears throat> okay, all right, verse 6, and he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. The certain man there is the father. And it's, it's not saying that God is a man. That's not what it's saying. It's a, it's a parable. It's a parable. So it's using metaphorical language, okay? So in this particular um, a parable, <clears throat> um, the certain man here who planted the uh, fig tree in his vineyard is God. I won't take you there now, but in Isaiah chapter 5, y'all remember God talked about 
planting uh, Israel in the land of Canaan as his choice vine. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. You can write that down. It's not on your outline. I'm just thinking of another one as we speak. And he planted Israel as a choice vine. And that means he uprooted her out of Egypt, 400 years in captivity, brought her out by Moses, brought her in through Joshua, didn't he? Right? And he planted her in their own land, in a land flowing with milk and honey, the land of Canaan, right? And then he, he made all kinds of accommodations for her, blessed her, gave her preachers, gave her prophets, gave her the law, all that stuff. And she still disobeyed him. But he planted it. That was the work of God. And it says in verse 6 that the certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and he found none. So God is looking for fruit in Luke 13 like Jesus was looking for fruit in Mark 13, wasn't he? Good. And verse 7 Then said he unto the dresser, notice this, unto the dresser of his vineyard. He says, behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. (laughs) Why cumbereth it the ground? It's just taking up unnecessary space. Cut the tree down. Okay. This is what the, um, the owner of the vineyard is saying. And he's saying it to who? The dresser of the vineyard. The dresser of the vineyard is Christ. I want you to see the role of the dresser of the vineyard. Okay, So he tells the dresser, hey, just cut it down. It's been here three years, and I ain't found no fruit on this tree for three years. What's the purpose, right? Verse 8, and he, the he in verse 8 is the vine dresser. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. I'm going to put manure all around it. I'm going to uh, 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 care for it, make sure it gets fertilizer and sun and light and water. All of those things represent the gospel. The gospel is light. The gospel is water. The gospel is a spiritual fertilizer that should cause us to grow. The gospel produces spiritual nutrients, doesn't it? And the gospel should produce fruit in us, doesn't it? Okay, the vine dresser here is Christ. Make sure you guys are with me tonight. What role is Jesus in verse 8 occupying in verse 8? It's one word. Don't give me a sentence. Just give me one word if you can tell me what what office or role Jesus is demonstrating in verse 8. Mediator. Write it down. Good. You ought to love that word. Because without a mediator, no one's going to heaven. This is why the other religions that think you can have a relationship with God without a go-between are deceived. Are to see. There's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, right? 1 Timothy 2 5. Okay, so Jesus here is occup- occupying the role of a mediator. Now, how, how long did a cedar tree was there? Make sure you guys are with me. Three years. And he said, just yeah, yeah, let's, uh, let us sit there for another year. How long was Jesus' ministry? Ah, any light bulbs going on? Good, good. Right. So, Think about it this way. If it wasn't for Christ, Israel would have been destroyed way before this. So listen, God in his mercy to Israel gave them space to repent. That shows us an attribute of the true and the living God. God is long suffering. God is gracious. God is here's, He's slow to anger. He's slow to wrath. He loves to give people space to repent, but he will eventually cut down the tree if it doesn't bear fruit. He will cut the tree down, okay? So let me tell you something. The three years and some change represent Jesus' ministry. We all know Jesus' ministry is about three and a half years, give or take, right? But let me add a detail to this, okay? A couple of things. So I'm hoping you guys are taking notes. Primarily, the person mediating here is Christ, But secondarily, it also represents his ministers and his people who share the gospel. When we share the gospel with people, we don't share the gospel without praying, right? We preach to people and then we say, Lord, have mercy on them. Lord, give them space to repent. Lord, be gracious to them. Lord, turn their heart. Lord, help them to believe the gospel, don't we? Right. Remember, your role as a believer, is a priestly role, and it primarily consists of two Ps. Preach and pray. Preach and pray. Preach and pray. Okay? So this is the Lord Jesus Christ doing this, but secondarily, it's also his ministers. This would be the 12 apostles. This would be John the Baptist uh, as well, and those that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? 
The other thing is <clears throat> um, this three and a half years, though it does refer to Jesus's three and some odd year ministry, but it would it's also um, uh, allegorical and met metaphorical. And it would include the 40 years from the time of Christ's crucifixion all the way up to the destruction of Jerusalem by the abomination of desolation that we've just been talking about the last several weeks, okay? What year was that? Who's with me? 70 A.D. And when was Christ crucified? Between 32 and 33 A.D., right around there, right? So you're looking at an additional 40 years. You need to remember that number because we're going to come back to it here in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> it, that would correspond to the whole time period because think about it. When Jesus was crucified and he gave up the ghost, lay in the grave until the third day, rose again, after 40 days he went back to heaven. It's 33 A.D. Jerusalem wasn't destroyed in 33 A.D. It wasn't destroyed in 34 A.D. It wasn't destroyed in 40 A.D. It wasn't destroyed in 50 A.D. It wasn't destroyed until when? Until about 70 A.D. That's an additional 40 years. That whole 40-year time period is all included in this three and additional year time period where Jesus is asking God for mercy. He's asking God for mercy on national Israel. Do you guys remember in, G in Luke 19 when Jesus wept over the city? You guys that read your Bible, do you all know what I'm talking about in Luke 19? When Jesus looked at Jerusalem, he looked at it, the city and he cried and he wept. You guys remember that? Um, and you guys also remember in Luke 13 where Jesus uh, talked about the city and he says, just like a mother hen would gather in her, uh, her uh, chicks, uh, her brood under her wings, he said, I would have gathered you in, but you would not. Israel didn't know the time of their salvation when Christ came, and therefore because they would not come to Christ for salvation and they crucified the Son of God, God brought his wrath on them in 70 A.D., okay? And then finally... The tree was cut down. So the, ultimately, the tree was cut down in 70 A.D. This is what Jesus is talking about in our text in the Olivet Discourse. All these things would happen when? In 70 A.D. So all these are going together. The fig tree would be cut down. <coughs> okay? <clears throat> so verse 8, And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. Look at verse 9. The digging about it and dunging it is preaching. The digging of, I would write that down if I were you. The digging about the tree and dunging it represents preaching. When you're preaching, that's plowing the, the fallow ground. Remember, Jesus says, no man that puts his hand to the what? Plow and, and looks back, right? He, he's, not, he's not fit for the ministry. And the putting the hand to the plow represents gospel preaching. Gospel preaching. Muzzle not the ox that treads out the corn, right? Are you guys seeing it? That's, that's 1 Corinthians 9, 9. I'm giving you scripture. 1 Corinthians 9, 9, Timothy chapter 5. Okay, so all this is uh, symbolizing agriculturally, it's describing the preaching of the gospel. But notice what it says here. Verse 8 shows that God is patient. Verse 9 shows that God is holy. But verse 9, he says, and if it bears fruit, well, and if not, then after that you shall cut it down. See that? Then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Now, who's talking there? The vine dresser, Jesus. So Jesus is merciful, but Jesus is also what? Holy, holy. Does Jesus bring wrath? Does Jesus bring wrath? Now, yes, the first time Jesus came to save. He didn't come to condemn the first time. The second time he's coming to judge, right? However... If you guys have read Genesis chapter 18, if you look at the, uh, no, Genesis 19 very carefully with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, do you remember it says that the Lord called down fire from the Lord? Do you guys remember that language? There's two references to the Lord there. The Lord, some of you remember, the Lord, Jesus on earth, called down fire from the Lord his father in heaven, to bring down fire and burn up the city. That was Jesus' order to do that. Jesus is almighty God. And Jesus reserves the right to save or to judge those who reject his gospel. All right, so good. Let's go back to our text. I hope you guys are seeing the connections here with the fig tree. And as you're going back to Mark 13, please notice that, again, there is no fruit on this tree. 
And that is the one thing that God is looking for on our tree, no matter how nice and pretty the leaves look. That doesn't impress God. What impresses God is fruit. And primarily the fruit that Jesus was looking for was faith. Faith. And the large majority of the Israelites that heard Jesus preach rejected him. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing I want you to see here is, so letter A, it says that the fig tree is a type of national Israel, right? It was also a symbol of Israel's prosperity. I'm not going to go to those verses tonight. You can look at those in your own time. But letter B, what else does a fig tree here typify? In our text, it says a sign of the ripe judgment to come. So here's another concept I want us to learn tonight. Look at verse 28 again. It says, now learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and puts forth her leaves. So the branch here is tender uh, because of the sun, the light of the sun, and the movement of sap. The movement of sap moving from the roots upward into the branches. Okay, so now it's soft. Something's getting ready to happen. And it says and puts forth leaves. When this happens, he says, you know, that summer is near. Right. You don't have to be an agriculturist to know this. If you just observe trees and observe plants, you, you, you know how when the weather changes, when we're going, you know, when it's autumn time or when it's spring and we're moving to summer and you can see the changes. Right. Jesus says in the same way, you can tell these signs and know that summer is near. Verse twenty nine. So ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. OK, now I don't know why the King James said nigh in verse 29 and near in verse 28. It's the exact same Greek word. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the King James does that sometimes. That, that's kind of frustrating sometimes when it does that, because then it can kind of throw you off. You don't you might not see the consistency there. It can be read near both times. Summer is near. And then it says, when you see these things come to pass, you know that it is near, even at the doors. That means it's impending, and it's just about to happen like someone who's just about to walk through the door, okay? All right, so letter B, what is Jesus teaching us here? The signs of ripeness, the signs of ripeness. And here's the lesson. Ripeness in the scripture symbolizes several things. One of those is judgment. You might not have considered ripeness as being a symbol of judgment, but in some contexts it is. OK, because what happens when these branches spring up in summer times, what's the next step? Ripe fruit appears. Ripe fruit appears. So what Jesus is saying, just as right around the corner, you would see ripe fruit. The Israel's ripeness for judgment. Is here and and, and at the doors, so just on the verge of the judgment of God coming, it, are these things occurring to show that Israel is ripe for ruin, ripe for judgment. God's wrath is on the verge of falling upon them. Okay? So let me demonstrate this in the Old Testament. So let's, first, let, let's, go, uh, let's go to Amos. We're going we're gonna to dive into some... Uh, some minor prophets, <clears throat> and the minor prophets are, are replete with this concept as well. <clears throat> so we'll go to Amos, and then we're going to work uh, from Amos, and then I think Joel, and then I think Nahum. I want you to see these very quickly, <clears throat> and we'll work our way through. So if you're in Amos, Amos talked about summer fruit as well. Everybody there? Keep in mind that Amos, this portion of scripture here, 785, uh, uh, 788, the late 780s. So this is before the Assyrian invasion. OK, Israel's on the verge of being invaded by the heathens. And notice what it says in verse one, Amos eight, Amos eight, verse one. It says, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me. Now, Amos is getting a vision. Watch this. Thus has the Lord God showed me and behold, a basket of what? There we go again. Right. OK, here's this fruit again. And he shows me a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people of Israel. You see that there? What's interesting is if you look this up in the Hebrew, both the, end, the term end and summer fruit are very similar Hebrew words. There's actually a play on words. It's kits and kayets. 
in the Hebrew, kits and kayets. They sound almost identical. So when he uses the term summer fruit, it's, a, it's an allusion to the judgment and the end coming for Israel on, in the Old Testament, the punishment for their sins. And, and notice he says here, and he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end has come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Whoa. Whoa. So many of you know this. When God says he's going to do something, he does it. Right? So God in 722, about 722, uh, B.C., God brought what nation in to punish Israel? Nope. Who, who, who was with us? Let me use a different. Nope. I taught you guys this before. 722. The Assyrians. He brought Assyria in at approximately 722 B.C. And the Assyrians primarily um, invaded the ten northern tribes, yes, Israel and Samaria. The ten northern tribes went into captivity and they never recovered, not even until this day. Did you guys hear what I said? They never recovered. They spread all into the world and they were absorbed into all the other different nations and they died off. They died off. But... A hundred years later, their little sister Judah, including Benjamin also, went into captivity in Babylon, but God brought them out. The ten went down, returned no more. The two went down and were brought out. Therefore, the two represent the elect of God. Did you guys see that there? They represent the elect of God. Read Zechariah chapter 13 in your own time. It was one third that were preserved when it went through the fire. The other two burned up. This is God's discriminating grace to show mercy on whom he'll show mercy and compassion on whom he'll give compassion. So then it's not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that showeth mercy. OK. All right. So these were the Syrians that were coming in. This is what Amos is talking about. And they were ripe for judgment. Look at verse three. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day. saith the Lord God, there shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. That's, a, that's, that's a, a, a serious image there, isn't it? An image of extreme judgment. Okay, But you can see the ripeness of the fruit. Let me show you another one. I'm going to go actually in reverse. Go to the book of Joel. Go to Joel, and then we're going to look at Nahum, and then we're going to come right back. You're going to go to jo Joel. I know some, some of us call it Joel. Go, go to uh, Joel 3. <coughs> mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, Joel chapter 3. Is everybody there? Hey, now while you're turning to Joel, I'm going to throw something at you. You don't need to turn there. Just let this go in, in your ears as you're turning. You guys have heard God use similar language before. Remember what God told Abraham when he says, Abraham, um, I'm going to bless you with a seed that's going to number like the stars in the sky. They're going to go into captivity into Egypt, and they're going to be down there for 430 years, and then I'm going to bring them out. When the iniquity of the Amorites was what? Full. That's the same connotation. And they would fill up the wrath of God toward them by 400 years of child sacrifice, abortion, uh, sexual perversions, worshiping of uh, false gods and idols and blaspheming God and all those things. And 430 years later, God would bring judgment and remove them from the land and then bring Israel into the land. But he said it would be when the iniquity was full. Or we can use the term when their judgment was ripe, when they were ripe for judgment. Okay, Watch Joel. He uses the same language. You guys here? <clears throat> Joel. Is everybody in chapter 3? Watch what it says here. Now God is, uh, let me for context look at verse 1. It says, because I need to get you to verse 13, but he says, uh, yeah, I need to get you. Verse 1, he says, for behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. See, I'm going to bring them out. He promises to deliver them. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. I'm going to tell you what that means in a minute, okay? <clears throat> I will uh, uh, gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. So he's going to gather all these nations for war. Doesn't that sound like Armageddon? 
Revelation chapter 16. Okay, this is really figurative because it refers to the Antichrist system that God is going to judge in the person of Christ on the last day. And they're going to be gathered for battle. And it's going to be over very, very quickly. <clears throat> and he said, I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there. Some of your, your translations will say judge them. Judge them. That, that's what that means here. And will plead with them there like you're in court. Plead with him there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And then he, he goes on. <clears throat> but for time's sake, I want you to pick up at verse 11. What's interesting is God is telling them, come on to fight. <laughs> come on to fight. Come on to battle. He's stirring up the enemy to something. Come on again. Give me your best shot. And all of you gather together for, for war. I love this because God is jealous to protect his people. He's jealous to fight his people. Don't we say the Lord fights our battles? The Lord loves to fight his people's battles. The Lord, the Bible says that God is a man of war. Doesn't the Bible say God's a man of war? Where does it say that at, guys? Exodus 15, right? It says it in Exodus just after they came out of, uh, 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 out of Egyptian bondage. God tore Egypt up for them, didn't he? Yeah, God is jealous for his bride. And look, he says, he says to all these heathen nations, look at verse 11. He says, assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause your mighty ones to come down, O Lord. So God is instigating the battle here. Come to the battle uh, uh, of Armageddon, is what he's saying. And this will be fulfilled in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what this tells me is as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ, the warfare against Christians, the warfare against the church is going to continue to increase and intensify. The persecution is going to intensify. We don't feel it here, so it doesn't mean a lot to us. We kind of take our freedom here for granted, but it won't be long when our freedoms are gone. And then we're going to take these verses seriously. But we don't take him as seriously today because we're not experiencing the physical persecution that our brothers and sisters are in third world countries and Muslim nations where they're being killed, beheaded, hanged and, and put in prison. But it's on its way. It's on its way here. And it'll be an apex of persecution and suffering for the church just before Christ comes back. And he says here, verse 12, Jehoshaphat, check this out. You guys know who Jehoshaphat is, right? Gullible, I love Jehoshaphat, kind of gullible Jehoshaphat. He was the king of Judah, right? Check his name out. Can you all see this color? Probably not, huh? Um, if not, I might need to do a darker color. Can you guys see that name, kind of? That's not a good color, huh? You can see it? You can't? Because that's because you have good eyes. All right. <laughs> she got those young eyes. All right, Jehoshaphat, Jehosh, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat. Je, for Jah or Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Shaphat in the Hebrew means judgment. Jehovah judges, Jehovah judges, that's what Jehoshaphat means. So it symbolizes the valley of Jehoshaphat is a symbol of God bringing his vengeance on all of the church's enemies. Now, we know spiritually Christ crushed our enemies at the cross, didn't he? Didn't he defeat the devil? Didn't he crush the serpent's head? Didn't he destroy him that had the power of death, even the devil? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. And our Philistine giant called our sin nature. Didn't he crush it when he died at Calvary's tree and liberate us? This is the only reason why we can believe the gospel. This is the only reason why we're free. This is the only reason you're at Bible study on a Friday night. On a Friday night. Because you're liberated by Christ. Apart from the grace of God, listen, the last place you would be and the last place I would be on a Friday night is studying God's word. That's the grace of God. That ain't nothing but the grace of God that changed your heart and gave you a love for God and a love for spiritual things. It's the evidence of conversion, right? Because you'd be in a nightclub or you'd be at the bar, right? Tell the truth or somewhere else you shouldn't be. 
Okay, we don't need to go through all the names. But because we are liberated, because Christ set us free by his death. Okay, so Jehoshaphat, verse 12. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Now, verse 13 is the uh, ripeness. Here it is. He says, put ye in the sickle. See it? Have you ever seen that language in the New Testament? Remember when the angels are called to put in the sickle? Matthew chapter 13? Because it was what time? Harvest time. Write it down. Matthew 13, verse 30 and 39. Matthew 13, verse 30 and 39. The harvest is the end of the world. Somebody read Matthew 13, 30. Just stay right here. Somebody please read Matthew 13, 30. Preferably if you have King James since this is what we're using. And read it out loud. Math, I want one person to read Matthew 13, 30 and another person to read Matthew 13, 39. What I love is the consistency of God's word, the coherency of God's word, the unity of God's word, and the simplicity of God's word. Who's going to read Matthew 13, 30? Now you saw the sickle here, right? Put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. This is judgment day where all those who rejected the gospel will be ripe for judgment. Okay, who's going to read 1330 nice and loud? She. Oh, okay. There you go. You guys heard that? And then we have 39. <coughs> Who, who's going to do uh, 39 for us? Okay, read it nice and loud. You got to read it louder. Right, right. You guys see that there? So the harvest is the end of the age, right? Or, or the uh, end of the world. Okay, good. So I wanted you guys to be a, a, uh, able to see that so you can see the connection here. So this is the day when all the wicked will ultimately experience that judgment that they were right for. So verse 13, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is what? Great. Their wickedness is great. Good. Let's do one more and go back. Go to Nahum. Turn to the book of Nahum. And I'll give you 25 minutes to find it. Okay, it's, it's right after Micah. Nahum. Beautiful. That brother came out of the region of Galilee, too, like our like our, our Lord and Savior who grew up in Galilee. All right. Is everybody in Nahum? I was joking about 25 minutes. OK. Everybody find it. It's right after the book of Micah and it's just before Habakkuk. All right. All right. Are we ready? Nehemiah chapter three. tear your pages there you go and then chapter three everybody there okay if you're in Nahum chapter three now Nahum what is Nahum this is good Nahum is prophesying the judgment on Nineveh who in the world is that the same nation that Jonah preached to but about 140 years later did you guys hear that the people that Jonah preached to actually got saved if we have questions in Q&A, I'll prove it to you. When they repented, that was real repentance. He got more converts in his sermon than Peter did at Pentecost. There was hundreds of thousands of people that repented at Jonah's preaching. All he did is said, 40 days and Nineveh is overthrown. That's all he said. They was repenting left and right. But it was their children, their grandchildren down the line who turned back to the practice of sin and violence and idolatry, and therefore God sent the prophet Nahum to pronounce judgment upon them, but this time the judgment would actually come. This is 120, 130 years down the line, okay? For context, look at verse 1. I need to really hurry. Um, verse 1, it says, Woe to the bloody city, because they were full of violence. He said, It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departs not. They were continuing to steal one from another. And it never ended. But look at the judgment. So verse 1 shows their sin. Verse 2 and following shows the judgment for the sin. Everybody get that? Verse 2, watch. The noise of a whip 
and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. See that there? The horseman lifts up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. And there is none end of their corpus, uh, corpses and they shall stumble upon their corpses. And then he goes on. So now the uh, uh, he prophesies of the judgment of the uh, Chaldeans coming in and punishing them. That's the context here. Now go all the way forward to verse 8. He prophesies, but I want you to see the rightness. That, that's why I brought you here to tie it into our text. Verse 8, King James says, are you better than populous? See that there? Are you better than populous? No. The word populous here should be translated Thebes. Thebes. <clears throat> you guys heard of the region, the city of the region of Thebes? Okay, Thebes is northern Egypt. It's northern Egypt. <clears throat> so when God brought other nations in, um, like the Assyrians, the Assyrians came in and invaded Ethiopia and in, in, in Egypt, and this region here. He says, no. He says, that was situated among the rivers that had the waters round about whose rampart or whose fort or protection was the sea, and her wall was from the sea. What is God saying? They had all kinds of natural fortresses that they would have trusted in to think, and our enemies can't get us, right? Like you can, your, your nation or city can be in a physical geographical location that makes it hard to get to you, like you might be way up on a mountain, or you might have an ocean coast that makes it hard for people to reach you, right? But if God is on the side of your enemies, there is, no, there is no protection that can stop it. Okay, this is what he's saying. <clears throat> and so he says, uh, verse 9, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubum were their helpers. That's, that's Africa as well. And then verse 10, he says, yet was she carried away. See it? All those natural geographical borders didn't protect them because only God can protect us. The nation that forgets God will be turned into hell, right? Application, don't ever put your trust in, any, in anything else to protect you but Jesus Christ. All right? Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. This is, this is horrible. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets. You, you guys know what the language, I don't need to be any more graphic than that. And they cast lots for her honorable men. And all her great men were bound in chains. That means they went into slavery. Okay, verse 11. It says, you also shall be drunken and you shall be hid. You also shall seek strength because of the enemy. But the, th the, the resources that they look to to protect them are not going to work, just like their enemies didn't work. Verse 12. All your strongholds shall be like what? There's our fig tree again. See it? All your strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. See it? If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. So two things here. Number one, the ripe fruit and ripe fig signifies what? What's the concept we're learning? Ripe for judgment. But also, if, you have, if you've eaten figs before... You know, there are some figs that get really, really big, right? And they cause the branch to kind of lean over, and it makes it easier for, and some of those figs get so ripe and they just fall off, and they're heavy, right? So these branches are leaning over. Not only are they, are they ripe for ruin, but they're the easier to knock off and to knock down and to fall. So they would be easy prey for their enemies that would come in and devour them because they trusted in men and not in God, okay? <coughs> All right. So good. So you, you guys can see that there. All right. I, I think we did enough with that. Let's go back to our text. <coughs> so you, you see these fig tree and fig illustrations all over your Bible. So when Jesus talks about a fig tree, the, the disciples who knew the Old Testament would have had all these passages in the back of their mind. They would have known what Jesus was saying. OK. All right, let's, let's move on. <clears throat> we got about 15 minutes. Look at letter C. I'll run through this. It says a reason for the judgment to come now. 
So we see a sign for the judgment, and now we see a reason for the judgment to come. And you got blank lines there, so you got to take a quiz. Why did God bring this judgment on Israel? It says it was for blank and blank, blank, blank on your lines, okay? What we've already learned tonight, so I don't need to take you to any other scriptures for this, and I'm just going to give you the answer. It says it was for, on the first line, you want to write barrenness. Barrenness on the first line. Israel demonstrated no fruit. They didn't trust Christ, and they didn't love God. No, no faith and no love. And we can even say because they were not rigid, the large majority of them did not have the spirit. They did not have any of the fruit of the spirit. OK, so barrenness. What does God do to trees that don't have fruit on them? Yeah. So barrenness and the other three lines are rejection of Christ. Rejection of Christ. <clears throat> OK. Now. Think about this for a minute. I'm not going to take you back there. I'm just going to make a comment. We're going to keep going because we, we don't have that much time left. But remember, Jesus gave the parable uh, uh, earlier of the vineyard. And he talked about the owner of the vineyard. He sent his servants to, to gather in fruit. And all, every time he sent servants, they were mocked and beat. Some of them were killed. And then he sent his son. And what did they do to his son? Right, right. Mark 12. And Jesus said, because of that, what's the owner of the vineyard going to do? And he said he's going to miserably destroy them, those wicked men. That's 70 A.D. But there's two things in the parable. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try my best not to take you over. I'm just going to put it up here, and we're going to keep going. I, I made this tie-in with us before. In that parable, there are two things. Number one, it was the, um, the, the, uh, the person of the son who was the heir, right? They rejected the son. They killed him because they were heir. And then at the end of the parable, it said they rejected the stone. <laughs> Remember the builders cast out the stone? And because they rejected the stone, that stone became the head corner of the church. You remember that? And what we learned is the son and the heir and the stone are all the same person. The son and the heir... And the stone are all Jesus. Is Jesus the son of God? Is Jesus the rightful heir of all things? Is Jesus our stone and our rock upon this rock? I'll build my church. That's right. So ultimately, it's because they rejected Messiah and they the root and it was finally cut down. Letter D. Let's make an application to ourselves again. Because the tree is not just Israel. It also represents the church. I've taught us this before. You and I are all trees. <coughs> We're all trees. <coughs> We're either a good tree or a bad tree. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by it. <coughs> right. And a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Neither can a good tree bring forth corrupt fruit. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. We know that. The question we all have to ask is, what kind of tree are we? And what will be the state and condition of our tree on Judgment Day? Judgment Day is an inspection of our trees. The only way that we will last and be able to stand the inspection is if we're in Christ. Unless we abide in Jesus, we cannot bear fruit. Quickly, John 15. <clears throat> Quickly go to John 15. Y'all know Jesus said this. That means a person that starts in Christ but departs from Christ will be a barren tree on the last day. It's not enough to start in Christ. We have to continue in Christ all the way until the end. <clears throat> That's what it means to abide in Christ. It means to remain. It's not something you did 20 years ago when you accepted Jesus into your heart. Okay? The question is not did you come to Christ, or did you one day profess faith in Christ? The question is, are you still following Christ today? John 15, I'm not going to go through the whole parable, but just look at a couple of verses here. For, uh, uh, <clears throat> verse 4, what's the first thing he says? Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch, that's us, cannot bear fruit of itself. 
That means two things. Number one, we need Christ. And ready? Most people, most people, a lot of people don't agree with this, but it's true. You need Christ and you need his church. You need Christ, but you also need his church. A lot of Christians think that they don't need the church. They just need Jesus. You cannot have a healthy relationship with Jesus while you're severed from his church. Jesus is the head and the church is the body. You can't even be connected to Jesus apart from the church. <clears throat> and the nutrients flow from the root through the branches to the fruit. So it says, abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. How do we abide in Christ? Can we make this real practical? <clears throat> One of the main ways that we abide in Christ is by his word abiding in us. Did everybody hear that? It's not possible to abide in Christ while we don't abide in his word. So 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 that means if if we we never spend time in God's word, that's a very dangerous place for our soul to be. Very dangerous place. Because apart from God's word abiding in us, we're not bide, abiding in Christ. <clears throat> okay? And staying under the preaching of the gospel. And staying in fellowship with the body. Uh, look what it says in verse 5. I am the vine, <clears throat> you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth what? Much fruit. So the key to having fruit on your tree on Judgment Day is to continue in Christ. You know what I love? We don't have to make ourselves produce fruit. I'm, I'm so thankful. Did, did you know that you don't have to muster it up to make yourself produce fruit? Abide in Christ and Christ will produce it in you. Christ will produce it in you. Okay. So <clears throat> he says, he that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do Nothing. Verse six, if a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. This is what happens when we separate ourselves from the body of Christ and from his word. And men gather them and cast them into the, the fire. That fire is talking about hell and they're burned. Verse seven, if here it is. If you abide in me, what does that mean? And my words abide in you. That's what I just said a minute ago, right? Now you got a Bible verse to prove it. If you abide in me, how do we do that, Lord? And my words abide in you. That's how you do it, child of God. And if you do this, you shall ask what you will, and it shall what? Woo! Write it down. That's the secret to answered prayer. That's the secret to answered prayer. What do you mean? If you, got, if you want God to answer your prayer, abide in, let his word abide in you. That makes sense to me. Listen, okay, how do we talk to God? It's called what? Prayer. How does God talk to us? It's called what? His word. If, if you and I do this, when, when we don't pray, this is what we're doing. Look at me. Look at me. We're doing this. That's what we're doing. I'm sorry. I need to reverse that. When we're not reading God's word, we're doing this. When we don't, when we don't read his word, we're doing this. So when we do this and then turn around and pray, God's going to turn around and do this. That's Proverbs 28 verse 9. Somebody read that, please. We're almost done. Somebody read Proverbs 28 9 so you can hear it in the Bible. <laughs> When we don't read, we're turning our ear away from his law. So then God says, then I'm going to turn my ear away from your words. So if you want God to hear your prayer and answer it, respond to his text messages. Did you get it? Respond to his text message. The Bible is our text, isn't it? From God. It's his text message to you. Some of us, got all, some of us have all kinds of text messages in our iPhone that we haven't responded to. Yep. All right, who's going to read Proverbs 28, 9? Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, we, you got to read it a lot louder because you're way in the back. See it? We turn our, way, our ear away from him. He looks at our prayer as an abomination. Okay? So it's important. If we want our prayers heard and answered, then we need to... Listen to his word and read his word and let his word abide in us. So verse seven, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That's not a spiritual credit card. 
<laughs> that don't mean just anything you ask God, he's going to give it to you, whatever it is. No, whatever you will, that's, that's with a regenerated will, a renewed will, which is rooted in a new heart. A new heart produces a new will. He does give us the desires of our heart. That's a renewed heart. That's a renewed heart, if it be according to his will, right? Verse 8, herein is my father glorified, he says it again, that you what? Bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. What does that mean? So shall you evidence and prove that you're really my disciples. It doesn't mean you become his disciples by mustering up fruit. It means your fruit bearing is the proof that you really are his disciple. That's what that means, okay? All right? <clears throat> okay, go to uh, letter E. <clears throat> we got to start wrapping up. And we're going to get ready uh, for Q&A here in a minute. If you're still watching us at home, you can start sending your questions in. we got about four minutes, and we're going to switch over into Q&A mode. We're going to open up the floor. Um, notice uh, one other thing I want to show you before we get out of here. Go back to Mark 13, please. <coughs> Jesus said that, th that his generation would not pass away until these things happened, okay? Um, verse 30. Verse 30, Mark 13, 30. Okay, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. What does he mean there? So when you read your Bible, a generation, <clears throat> depends on the context, can vary a little bit. Okay, does anybody know what a generation is? Well, uh. God told Abraham that it would be in, I believe he said, the fourth generation that he would bring his people out. So in that context, it was about 100 years. But it varies depending on, sometimes the context, depending on the context, sometimes the term generation is describing the characteristic of that people group at that time. Sometimes it's not referring to a literal number. But primarily, generally speaking, <clears throat> A generation, I'll give you the answer to put on that blank line, is 40 years. So you want to write that down, 40 years. 40 years. I'm going to give you two proofs. Okay, I got, a I got several verses on there. You can look those up in your own time. I'm going to quote one or two of them because we're going to have to close in a minute. Um, number one, he Hebrews 3 and in Psalms 95, it, God says that he was grieved with that generation for 40 years. You guys remember that? That are with us on Sundays going through Hebrews? God was grieved with that generation 40 years. And when Jesus died on the cross, it was about 33. When was Jerusalem destroyed? So almost 40 years, just like Jesus said. Right. And I have other verses on there. I have Deuteronomy 1 and Deuteronomy 2. You can look those up in your own time. Uh, we don't have to belabor that point, but you're looking at about 40 years, which means Jesus' prophecy was pinpoint right on, just like he said. All those things happened just before the end of that 40-year period happened, just like our master said, which shows that Jesus is perfect. <clears throat> he knows all things. He's God incarnate. Okay, let's close with point two here. I, I, oh, I was really looking forward to getting into three, A, B, and C, and D. We'll have to save that for next week. Go ahead and put a line between two and three. This is our closing point. I'm really looking forward to getting into point three next week, Lord willing. But let's close here. Here's our closing consideration. <clears throat> and I want you to read verse 31 in our text. We're going to close with verse 31. Jesus makes a very powerful statement that no other human being in human history has ever been able to make. Jesus says <clears throat> in verse 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. No other human being can ever talk like that, okay? What does that teach us when Jesus says that? Well, first, he's got to be God to talk like that, right? And Jesus has to be the God of the Old Testament because that language comes from the Old Testament. God in the Old Testament talks like that, right? They add a great I am. So point two, the words of Christ are more enduring and everlasting than the very universe they uphold. 
The words of Christ are more enduring and everlasting than the very universe they uphold. So God's, uh, Jesus' words are more firm, they're more unchangeable, they're more immutable and everlasting than the universe itself. I'm just going to give you one proof. What is it that holds the universe together? The words of Christ. Did you guys know it's the words of right now? The reason why the universe has not totally imploded and exploded is because the word of Christ is holding the three, two, three hundred billion galaxies together. He, he, that, that word that spoke it into existence is holding it together. That's Colossians 1.17, by the way. Colossians 1.16 says Jesus created it all. Colossians 1.17 says he holds it all together. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> and Hebrews 1 says that uh, all things are held together by his word. He, uphol he upholds all things by the... Yeah, Hebrews 1.3. We're not going to turn there because we're going to close in, in the Old Testament. But Hebrews 1.3 says, who by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty of high, on high. But it says he upholds all things by the word of his power. And Hebrews 1 says Jesus is more everlasting than the universe. In fact, look at that real quick. Go to Hebrews 1. <clears throat> Come back to Mark next week. <clears throat> Check this out in Hebrews 1 real fast. Can I get a volunteer? Raise your hand if you'll read Psalms 119, 89. All right, then we'll have to turn it in. Okay. You guys in Hebrews 1? Hebrews 1, look at verse 3. It says about Jesus, it says, Who being the brightness of God's glory, brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. It's the word of Christ that holds the universe together. Now go down to verse 10. Watch what God says about his own son. This is the father talking to the son. And you, Lord, he calls Jesus Lord, in the beginning have laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They shall perish, but you remain. That means you're more enduring than the universe. They shall all wax old as does a garment. And as a vesture shall you fold them up, and they shall be changed, but you are the same. And your years shall not fail, which makes Jesus the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, right? All right, quick, 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 Psalms 119. We're not Testament, incarnate in the new. The God of the Old Testament, incarnate in the new. The second person of the Trinity came down. The first person did not come in the flesh. Neither did the third person, the second person did, who is eternal God. Psalms 119, look at verse 89. I'm just reading three verses. They don't even need explaining. All you're going to see here is the enduring nature of God's word. Everybody there? Okay, Psalms 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled where? How long? Forever. Go to verse 152. <clears throat> Verse 152, concerning your testimonies, I have known of old that you have founded them. How long? Forever. That means longer than our universe will exist. Look at verse 160, and we're done here. Verse 160, your word is true from the beginning, and every one of your righteous judgments endures how long? Forever. Jesus comes in the New Testament and uses similar language to demonstrate he is Yahweh of old from everlasting to everlasting and think about it. The word that he gives us is the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel that if you turn from your sins and believe on Jesus, you will have everlasting life. Amen. All right. OK, so uh, thank you guys for your patience. We'll pick up there next week. Let's go right into Q&A um, and we'll need to get the microphone out. And then if somebody can man the stream and let us know if anybody from home sent in questions, we're going to try to tackle those questions <coughs> before we pray and go home. So the first hand up is over here. Uh, 
It's low. Okay. So put the mic all the way up to your mouth like a hip hop artist. And 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 talk loud into it, okay? <coughs> God bless you, brother. All right, take care. Who who do we have going first? <coughs> all right, all right. Um, let me throw this out there, too, before we get our first question. Uh, I mentioned it on Sunday. New members class is Saturday, April the 13th. Let me confirm that. Yes. So if you didn't sign up, we had more people sign up today. But if you are interested in becoming a new member and or becoming baptized, make sure you sign up. Don't miss the class. See either me or Elder Mike before you leave, please, if, if you're interested. Okay, who, who's got our first question? Okay, she's going to need the microphone. Oh, it's not working at all. All right. There's a question online. Okay, let me get yours, then we'll get the online question. You're just going to have to say it out loud. Hopefully we can capture it without a mic. Okay, go ahead, sister. Thirty-four, thirty-one. Uh, thirty-four, thirty-one. Thirty-four, thirty-one says, and they said, should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? I don't think that's the verse you're looking at. But what's the general question you're asking? In the Bible, if the Bible says, and God said unto that person, or if you see in Scripture where it says, and God said, unto, there are multiple ways in the Old Testament by which God spoke to them. Sometimes it was an audible voice. Sometimes it was an audible voice. That's how he talked to Moses. He had a face-to-face -face relationship with Moses, metaphorically. Sometimes it was through a dream. Sometimes it was through a vision. Sometimes it was through a trance. Uh, there are multiple ways that God chose. Sometimes it was through angel visitation. There were numerous ways. In the New Testament, he, he's spoken to us through Christ, and he continues to speak to us through the scriptures. But in the Old Testament, there was a whole plethora of ways that he chose to. But any of those ways, God could um, decide <clears throat> to employ uh, to speak to his people. Mm -hmm. uh, next, you want to go ahead and read the question from home? Can you tell us who it is? Okay. I'll go in reverse. So a, a, a two-head baby. Um, the first thing we would want to realize is that you and I live in a fallen world. And it's because, because of the sin of Adam and Eve that the world, Romans chapter 8, is anguishing under the weight of vanity because of the curse of sin. So birth defects, birth deformities... And birthing accidents, which still happen today, even with our advancement in technology, they still happen. Those would all be the result of the curse of law. And usually, there's exceptions, but usually with extreme birth defects, a lot of times a baby doesn't live a very long life. Um, the, but the blessing in that is those children that, if they do pass away in infancy or early, early, uh, very, very early childhood, they're, they're uh, under the blood of Christ. And they experience instant heaven. Um, but the beautiful thing is that even with deformities and birth defects and things like that, uh, God is still merciful and gracious. All children ultimately are the Lord's. They still belong to him. And um, sometimes God is pleased to let people... John chapter 9, the man that was born blind. He was, he was born blind not because he did anything wrong or because his parents did anything wrong, but it was for the glory of God. And the power of Christ would be manifest by healing him in John chapter 9. So even those ultimately, even though it's the, the, ultimate, it's the effect of sin, and yet God still uses it for his glory. Um, and then you mentioned twins. 
in the Bible. There are many instances in the Bible where there are twins, like the first one, uh, you said co-joined, but they're still twins. Yeah. So. But to what? No, we talked about that one already, but he gave a second illustration. <clears throat> Oh, she sent the same question twice? Okay, so, yeah, uh, Exodus. Let me give you a scripture. <clears throat> Go to Exodus chapter 4. <clears throat> it's still ultimately for the glory of God. The Lord's made all things for himself. Even though we don't necessarily understand it, Paul talked about his infirmities and God asked or Paul asked God three times to remove his infirmity in the flesh. And God told him, no, but his grace would be sufficient. So if a person grows up with a birth defect or a physical uh, infirmity, it makes them all the more dependent upon the grace of God, it makes them all the, all the more dependent upon Christ. <clears throat> but look at what it says here. Verse Exodus 4.10, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore. So we know Moses had a speech impediment, right? So he had a, a problem as well. It says, Nor since has thou spoken unto your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Look at verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb or the deaf? Or the seeing or the blind, hath not I the Lord? So the Lord is still able to get glory out of those little precious children uh, that are born that way. And um, it, can, it can be good. The Lord can take that and use good and bring good out of it because it, it could be used of the Lord to cause that child to lean even more on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, those uh, birth deformities and defects um, can be used for the humility of the parents. It can be used to cause the parents to pray and to seek to read God's word and to be under a gospel ministry, to bring them to their knees and to draw them into a closer, more dependent relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of good that God can draw out of it. But however a person is born into the world, whatever their physical condition, the Lord's ultimately sovereign over it. And one way or the other, he has an ultimate purpose for his own glory in it. OK, so hopefully that helps. Let's go to the back there, Sister Samantha. You got a question? Yes, Sister Thank the Lord for asked this question. Anyway, so recently in the media, there was a set of joint twins that just got married. Yes. One body, two heads. So, right, right, right. But only one of them got married. So does that mean the other one is guilty of adultery because she's no. not married? No, you know better than that. I know, that's why I'm asking. No. Just think it through. That that person, they don't have any choice in that. How 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 could they be guilty of committing adultery? They haven't even acted. They haven't done anything. No, not at all. That that's a very that's a very difficult situation. It's a very rare and exceptional situation, unfortunate situation. But that person doesn't have total control over all of their body. That that person um, is not acting in any way, transgressing. God. That's a very, very difficult situation. So My the goodness. Is the I, wow. Well, they already are, right? Well, no, the other one is not married. Can she now still marry? I would think so. Because marriage is the uniting of two souls together. I don't know all the, <laughs> the details of how that would work. But I know nothing's impossible with the Lord. Just, just get up, be, be away somehow. Um, that they would be able to do that. That's a very, very rare, difficult situation. Would require a lot of uh, prayer and asking Lord, the Lord to guide them and give them the grace to, to know how to navigate that. But, I mean, what's the percentage of that? That's extremely, probably like one in a billion, or probably even less than that, right? But no, it's not the other person's fault that the, that the other half falls in love with somebody and marries them. They haven't done anything wrong. Um, I think in my limited understanding of that situation, just having like five seconds to kind of reason that through right now on the spot, I would say I think it's possible for them to be married. Now, there's probably not enough of them for them to be divided, huh? 
and survive, right? I'm guessing. I don't know the story. Um, but yeah, I would, I would imagine that there's got to be some way, but I don't know all the details of how that would fit. Yeah, that, that's a tough situation. But I, I, I would think so, how yes. I read an article on she got more into detail. She just said she tunes out in adult time. Actually, I read about that. Yeah. They say that there's no, no physical. Don't, don't be too detailed, okay? Because we got kids and I don't know what you're going to say, but just just don't don't give too many details. That's whatever. what I'm going to say. Uh, yeah. I'm just, just like being able to say something. The agreement uh, or what I read indicates that there's, mm, that there's no connection between the married person and then, if that makes sense, the husband and the twin that got married, there's like this agreement of not crossing the line of intimacy. No conjugation in the marriage? Yeah. No, that's not what I read. That's what I read. That's not what we read. Okay. And you guys could be talking about two different scenarios too. No, so it's, it's, that, that, that's possible. Yeah, they would need a lot of wisdom. They would they would need the grace of God to be able to work that out. But I believe that I believe the Lord I believe it can be done by God's grace. I do. As difficult as it is. Wow. Yeah. Okay, next question. I love the, the authenticity and the honesty in your question. Uh, go to Luke 17 and let the scripture answer that question. We would do well if we were honest like that. You know what I mean? Uh, a lot of Christians are afraid to admit that. That they struggle from time to time with faith. I, I know, I, I guarantee you that all of us in here, well, I'm talking about after salvation, probably woke up one day and said, yeah, is this thing real? Don't, don't act like your faith is perfect. It's just not. For none of us. All, Sister Audie, all of us have been there. All of us. I'm going to give you two scriptures to kind of encourage you, okay? None of us have perfect faith. But remember, all you need is mustard seed size faith. That's all you get. Look at, uh, I'm talking about uh, your brother trespasses against you seven times. You're supposed to uh, uh, forgive him seven times, and even seven times seventy. He says in another place, verse five, and the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. That's a good prayer request. Lord, increase our faith. We got to do that. Lord, we got to increase our faith. Help him, brother. Help us, sister, right? That's what you say. When that happens, say, Lord, help us, sister. Increase my faith, Lord, I am struggling today. And guess what? Even asking the Lord to increase your faith is evidence of faith. Because it takes faith to pray. Right? If you didn't have saving faith, you wouldn't even be concerned to even ask that question. Okay? A unregenerate person is not concerned about that at all. A person who loves the Lord and really wants to honor Him with faith struggles with that. Look at Mark 9, the other one I want to show you. All of us need God's grace and help to continue to believe. Fight the good fight of faith. It's a daily fight. But by God's grace, you, you will win. You will win. And while you turn into Mark 9, over and over Jesus said to the disciples, how is, how is it that you have so little faith? Right? Or how is it that you have no faith? Or Disciples, where is your faith at? Didn't you hear on Sunday after the resurrection the disciples they heard and the sisters when we saw him he rose again and said the disciples didn't believe. They spoke too. Mark 9. You, you know where I'm going. Look at verse uh, 23. This is the, the father of the demoniac child. Jesus said unto him, if you can believe all things are possible to him that believes. Now watch how honest the dad is. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears Lord, I believe. Help thou my. He said, I got unbelief. I'm 
servant would help me, Lord. That's an honest, honest believer right there. And we learn an honest person won't go to hell, right? Yeah. Yep. So what do you do when your faith is weak? Tell Jesus. Tell Jesus. And ask him to increase your faith. That's all. You're not alone. That's all of us in the same battle with you. All right, what's the next question? So I made the second chronicles. I can't exactly remember where it is. And I'm reading about how I think it's the one who, who was king at seven. I can't remember exactly where it was, but I think it's Josiah is, but... Um, second Chronicles... Yeah, I can't remember exactly. You said Second Chronicles 21? It might be 21, actually, because my question is, in the beginning it talked about how Josiah was was, um, was good inside of the Lord. But then when I read it the second time, it said he was good inside the Lord only until the priest had died. And then later on... Who, Josiah? Or, I don't know, maybe it's the... No, 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 you, no not Josiah. You, you're talking about, um, I think you're talking about uh, second... That's second Chronicles 24, I think. Second Chronicles, yeah, yeah, chapter 24. No, that's not Josiah, you're talking about Brother uh, Joash. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, in this case, of course, I would read the other part when Chronicles was seen, but those personal still saying... Because, um, or not this person, but just the connecting with another person. Um, the man who um, was mad at the Lord after he said he did something wrong. And um, he did what he killed him. Yeah. Yeah, he killed him. After, I believe it was Jehiada when he left. Yeah. Who was the picture of the Holy Ghost. So I want to know if those situations. You want to know if he's saved? Yeah. So I, I know what you're talking about. Um, Jehiada is a picture of the Holy Ghost. Okay. And he was, he was good while Jehiada was there left and he departed. That's a tough question. I, there are some theologians and, and preachers that believe he was saved and there are others that don't. They're kind of split right down the middle. So that one with the departing of Jehiada and what he did, I don't want to be overly dogmatic. Um, so I'll give you you know, what I think, but I would not take this one to the bank because this, this is a difficult one to kind of work through. Um, I remember studying this a long time ago um, I disagree with the other theologians. I think he was saved. Um, I believe that that is a picture of apostasy. And, and Jehiada dying, the spirit departing from the person like Saul, and then him going and doing what he did just before he died. Um, I, I look at that as a picture of a person that, uh, that actually is uh, not regenerated. Um, that's the position that I hold with that. Like I said, um, I'm not going to be overly dogmatic about it. Um, I'm willing to continue to study that and look that through. Um, I'm willing to be open to different, you know, sound interpretations that will demonstrate from the scripture. So that's that's kind of how I want to answer that. So in that case, I've asked this question before, but I really wondered because I feel like I've kind of went through what has went through. What part? In the sense where the Lord had to humble me and kind of make me go crazy a little bit to then make me realize who the truth was. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel from that that he was such a went through. Even if he wasn't if he wasn't saying that, I don't argue that. He's but still a human being, being. where you yeah. yeah. It's never been under it seemed like he had a single sign of true repentance, but the Bible doesn't really speak on him after that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah. No, I do not believe at all that Nebuchadnezzar was saying. Okay. Um, there are evidences of him acknowledging the sovereignty of God, but I don't see evidence of him putting a saving faith and trust in that God. Like Darius acknowledged after Daniel survived in the lion's den that his God was the true God, uh, but he's not demonstrating to me from what I see, demonstrating conversion and faith in Christ himself. So no, I would say no. And in fact, Isaiah 13 and 14, Isaiah chapter 14, Nebuchadnezzar is a picture of the devil. Lucifer, right? Historically, that's King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, so, so no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he was uh, converted. I would show that God showed mercy to him. God humbled him. And after, what, seven years crawling on his hands and knees and growing his, uh, his uh, nails out and his hair out and eating grass like an ox, he, he, he was humble and he came to himself. He says, God is, God is king and he's sovereign. I'm not. And then he just disappears after chapter four. And you don't see Nebuchadnezzar anymore after Daniel chapter four. He goes off. 
Uh, ultimately, only God knows from, but from what I see in the scripture, I don't, I don't see regeneration there. Yeah. Okay, good question. Good questions. Any other questions? Sister Deb, and then back there, one, two, three, and then we'll pray. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I noticed I had that in my study somewhere in all my notes. Up, but that was one of the things that I thought about, too, in the study. Yes, because the heat, the summertime, that's the approaching of the heat. That also signifies the approach of the fiery wrath of God coming as well. It definitely does. Uh, Paul also talked about Israel uh, filling up the wrath of God all way in First Thessalonians chapter 2. God's a consuming fire. You definitely can. Yep. Yeah, that's a good observation. That's right. Uh, okay, Brother Craig. <coughs> um, I have a question in 1 Peter. Okay, hold on. 1 Peter, chapter 4, okay. Verse 17 through 18. Uh, yeah, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if the first begin at us, what shall the end, what shall be the end? Of them that obey not the gospel. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner be? Okay. So, you know, I hear that, you know, you drop the righteous and the sinner at the same time. Yes. But, you know, I'm looking at it like this as, as a Christian. Though we don't partake or contain the sin, right? Yes. But it's like, but if we are sinners, how are we in the same category as the ungodly and the sinner? We're not. So look at what it says here. It says the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Are you thinking because it says judgment begins at the house of God? That, is that why you no, thought we're not? I'm just looking at the, the context of eight, verse 18. How okay, I'll, I'll get that one. And if it first begins at us, what should be the end of them that obey not the gospel? He's making a distinction. Us, them. Us, them. See the difference? Right. Okay. And in verse 18, if the right and if the righteous scarcely be saved. That's one group. Right. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's another group. So that's the, the sinner part is what's throwing me off. This, so, good question. You guys see what he's saying? When you read in the context, if you have in the same sentence righteous and sinner, the righteous in that context would be the believer, and the sinner in that context would be the non-believer. Like Jesus used the term uh, publicans and, and, and uh, a sinner. Or um, Matthew chapter 18, the person that... Um, comes under church discipline and he offends one person, they come to him, he won't be reconciled, and two or three come to him, and then finally the, the church approaches him and then he, he doesn't respond, and that sentence, then he says, um, verse 17, if he neglects to hear them, tell it unto the church, but if he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto them as a heathen uh, and, a, and a publican, so that would be as an unregenerate person. There are other places in Scripture I have to think in my mind right now uh, where sometimes the term sinner is referring to a non-regenerate person. In our context, it makes it easy for you to see the distinction because the same distinction you see in verse 17 is the same distinction you see in verse 18. So look at verse 17. For the judgment is, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of who? God. Who is that? That's us. Same people. And if it begins at us, Say, people, what should be the end of them that obey not the gospel? Who are they? Unsaved. Verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be, scarcely be saved, that's the same group that was originally right. mentioned. Verse 17. The saved. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's the non saved or the unregenerate. Yeah. Because you're not having a conversation, you know, when you hear, well, you're a sinner too. We are. Technically, we sin. We yes. Do, so we still have the sin. But. but but to be in the same category as the righteous. No, to be in the same category as the ungodly. Right. That makes it kind of hard to understand. Here's the distinction. Before salvation, we lived in sin. That was our characterization. Now we're in Christ. Our characterization is righteousness. Before salvation, we lived in sin. After salvation, sin lives in us. 
but it no longer reigns. Christ reigns. We no longer live a lifestyle of sin, 1 John 3, 9. Right? I can take you to several places in the scripture where believers are called righteous. Believers are called righteous. In several places, right? I think it's Luke 6, 45, that God puts, it, puts in us a good and honest heart, a good heart. Uh, he makes us righteous. The very work which it created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them, right? We, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we are the very righteousness of God in Christ. Positionally, we're righteous in Christ, right? But practically, if we've been saved, we do obey God and we do walk righteously. Not perfect, but our, our life is characterized by righteousness if we're really saved. It is. Okay. Good question. Any other? Okay, you're going to close this out, I guess. Yeah. Um, my question comes from 1 Kings 11. It's not really just one verse, okay. there's more so the whole yeah, passage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Solomon and his fall and all that. Yeah, yeah so I've been, um, I've been trying to understand what specifically Solomon was doing um, in that worship of false idols that made God, you know, obviously judge him. But, so, my question, because I've been studying the types of gods that he set up, Ashtoreth, Chemosh, Ashtoreth was sex cults, Milcom was giving your kids to the idol. Yeah, that's the same as Molly. Yeah, and yeah. the action was not that he just set up the place and then left for his wife to go. The, the verb tense go with after is a continuing action, so it's more so he was actually engaging in these things. But I want to understand, was he engaging not only in the sex cult stuff, but also like the child sacrifice worship stuff as well? Like, what was he... Well, it does, it, uh, it, so I'm going to read a couple verses here. So you know he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's part of the problem right there. And, and he, he married men and women. In Deuteronomy 7 said, don't do that. Don't turn your hearts away. That's what happened. Deuteronomy 17, 17, the key is not to multiply wives. He disobeyed that one too. So verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. So it implies his heart was temporarily turned away. And it came past when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. So it implies that temporarily that he most likely participated, not just set up the groves for his wives to do it, but that he likely temporarily participated in it too. Uh, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth. The, see, it doesn't just say his wife. It says he went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, that, that's Moloch, and the abomination of the Amorites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as David his father and then on. So, yeah, it implies that he did that temporary apostate. He didn't utterly go apostate. He did fall. Yes. Bam. And God, and, and then God punished him, uh, but he did recover. We know that because of the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of his repentance. He said, man, I was tripped, and all that was vanity. All that was vanity. Ultimate riches is, is in Christ. It's a sad story, and we can learn a lot of lessons from it because of all that he suffered. Verse 9, God was angry with him. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had... Here twice. So, mm. yeah, so my, my question was more so, it was off, it's easy to understand that he definitely did the asterisk sexual worship. I'm trying to understand, did he do the... The Malcolm? The person, I mean, the, 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 the child sacrifice? sacrifice? Yeah. We have to only speak where scripture speaks. Um, and I don't want to inject into the text something that doesn't explicitly say it. And I would hate to say he did that part when he didn't. Um, so I'm, it doesn't say that he did that, but it implies that it's a possibility. Um, but what, what, I think it's safe for us to be silent with the scripture assignment. And it doesn't explicitly say he did that like it does with King Manasseh. Second Chronicles 33, it explicitly says he, he did it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he calls others to do it. And he actually got saved. So God can save a person even from that sin. It's, it's, it's sad. And this is one of the ways we know God's word is true because it doesn't leave out the, the dirt and the, uh, the bad parts and the blocks 
in his people's character to show us that there's only one person in Scripture that had no spots and no blots in his character is Jesus Christ. It, it, so, yeah, I, I hear you, but it's, it's sad, but it's true. He, we'll see him in heaven. God turned him. He had three repentance. He turned him. Uh, Elder Jackson. Yeah, quick yeah. uh, question. Can you speak on uh, the grounds for babies uh, going to have the yeah. parish that's given for before? And uh, what are the grounds for that? Sure. So, for the, I'll give you the condensed version. Because the uh, time goes to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm thinking a lot of passages right now uh, for whoever might be considering that. Deuteronomy chapter 1 is a good place. It's like verse 39 and, and following um, 2, Sam, uh, 2 Samuel 12 with David's child. David clearly knew that the baby that passed away would go to heaven. But one place I want to use is 2 Corinthians 5 for time's sake. The simple answer is that a, a, a child that dies in the womb or di dies in early infancy goes to heaven not because they're pure, because they're not pure, because we all are contaminated with sin nature. We're all born with that. But God is a righteous judge, and that little infant or child has not committed personal transgression. They have the sin of Adam imputed to them, but they don't go to hell because God doesn't punish the children for the sins of the parents and the parents for the sins of the children. Deuteronomy 24, 16, and also Ezekiel 33. Those are passages you can look at as well. But one, I, I, let me just read verse. Verse 2 Corinthians 5, 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. A little infant hasn't done anything, or a child that passes in the womb hasn't done anything. That they may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or evil. There is no actual personal transgression that that little fetus or embryo or newborn can be uh, uh, condemned for. And therefore, God shows mercy on those little infants and covers them in the blood of Christ and they pass, they experience it's heaven. This is why David could say when he said, the child's not coming to me, but I'm going to him. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. So would you say that that child then will be able to say that since God took him as a gift that they were God's life? Absolutely, 100%. That's the only way. Yeah, it, right? God knew before they were born how long they would live, right? It's appointed a man. Once to die and after this judgment, right? So God knew that that per just like God knows one person is going to live 95 years, God knows that this person is going to live a month and whatever it is. And so God has already written their names in the Lamb's Book of Life, and therefore they're under the blood of Christ, who's the <clears throat> Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So they would have to be the elect of God. Yep. Yeah. It had to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Wow. And how does that connect with the nature of accountability and how far mm -hmm. a child goes, like one or two or three years old? So, five? yeah, so there is a such thing as the age of accountability. Um, the, the scripture does not give you and I a hard, fast number. There's so many variables that have to be considered. We know that a good round number in Israel because you would enter into your bar mitzvah 12 years old, you would, 12 and 13, you entered into adulthood. And so that would have been a, a good round age by which in that Hebrew culture where a person would be considered culpable and accountable for their sales, they would enter, begin to enter into adulthood and take on their own personal responsibility. But that's going to vary from child to child. Ultimately, only God knows because some children develop very, very mentally, very slowly and some faster than others. So... We, I think it, we want to stay away from a hard, fast number by which we want to lock everybody under that number. So we don't, I don't think we can necessarily know the exact age, but we know there is a point of crossing over where a child would pass over from a state of what we would call innocency, 
where they are, don't have actual personal transgressions uh, accounted to them to where they enter over into a realm of accountability because we don't know exactly when that is and it varies from child to child in their development because they're so complex. We preach the gospel to them as early as we can possibly preach to them even in the womb because we know God can save even in the womb and then we leave the salvation results up to God. Yeah, okay, thank you, Elder. All right, if that's, if that's it, we're going to pray. All right, no other questions going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, Father, thank you for your word. <clears throat> we thank you for your incredible grace that where sin abounded, grace did much, much, much more abound. We thank you for Jesus Christ, and we thank you that his cross work is able to cover all of our sins, no matter what we've done or how many our transgressions are. We know the cross is both quantitatively and qualitatively greater than all of our sins. Help us to trust on Christ, for he is the only Savior and there is no other. Bless us with traveling mercies, Lord. Help us to leave here thankful for your salvation. Bring us back on Sunday for worship at 1.30. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.